Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is Gas Sources and Vacuum Systems, presented by Doug Baker of Teledyne Hastings. Okay, Doug, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, Shelley, for getting us started. Uh, hello, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Gas Loads in Vacuum Systems. During the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to explore the different sources of gas in vacuum systems. Some of these will seem pretty obvious, and some might be completely new to you, uh, but hopefully by the end of the webinar, you may have a better understanding of what is going on in your vacuum system and understand the various limitations and perhaps get some ideas of opportunities for improvement. My name is Doug Baker, and I'm the Director of Sales here at Teledyne Hastings Instruments. Our company, located here in Hampton, Virginia, USA, designs, builds, and sells vacuum gauges, mass flow meters, and mass flow controllers. And before we really begin, I'd like to quickly mention that this webinar is being recorded. So you'll be able to uh, find this webinar in the corresponding slide deck uh, posted along with our other webinars in the Resource Center of our website. At our Resource Center, you can also watch product videos, read application notes, and download free data acquisition software. Okay, let's get started. Our agenda today starts with a quick description of the simple equation that is going to determine our vacuum system pressure. And, spoiler alert, the system pressure is going to be determined by our pumping speed as well as the system gas load. Now, the gas load in any system can be made up of multiple gas sources, so we're going to explore a number of these. And as we touch on each gas source, we're going to look for opportunities for improvement. That is, we would like to reduce the gas load and thereby reduce our system pressure or improve the health, if you will, of our system. Now we know that there are a wide variety of vacuum systems out there with very different goals. Some systems are industrial in nature and some require very clean, oil-free conditions. Some systems only need to reach a few millitor or even tenths of a millitor, while others must be able to reach UHV, um, ultra-high vacuum conditions. On this slide, I'm showing images of two of the many systems that we have here at Teledyne Hastings. On the left, you're looking at the back of a diffusion pump-based system that is used on one of our vacuum furnaces. Our vacuum furnaces here are used in the manufacture of our largest laminar flow elements. Some of those laminar flow elements are mounted on 8-inch flanges and can measure flows up to 15,000 standard liters per minute. On the right is one of our UHV chambers, uh, which is used in engineering for the development and testing of vacuum gauges. The point here is that every vacuum application has its own set of vacuum requirements, not only in terms of required pressure, but also in terms of cleanliness, or maybe you're going for a certain gas composition. A common goal here is that the vacuum system is a means to control the internal environment. And all the systems associated with these vacuum applications are going to play by the same basic rule. At some point during pump down, the system will usually reach a point where there's a dominant gas source that may need to be dealt with before the system's going to go any lower. And that simple equation is Q equals SP, where Q is the gas load, S is the effective pumping speed, and P is the pressure. Now, I didn't want to spend a lot of time during this webinar talking about different gas regimes but it's important for us to have some idea of gas behavior in our chamber. In the rough vacuum region, towards the relatively uh, high pressure end of the band shown here, the gas behaves as a fluid. Now, as the system pressure is reduced, the gas density decreases, and we eventually reach a point where the molecule's mean free path, that is, the average distance of molecule, uh, between molecule to molecule collisions, is greater than the dimensions of the chamber. So, as we get into the high and ultra-high vacuum region, you want to think of the gas as a collection of free molecules. That is, molecules rarely encounter each other. That's what we call molecular flow. And speaking of, of uh, mean-free path, uh, I want to share a little equation 
um, to help you understand molecular behavior in high vacuum systems. Uh, the equation shown there at the bottom, that is the mean free path, which we usually refer to as lambda, the mean free path in centimeters is five divided by the pressure in millitor. So to put that in some perspective, when the pressure reaches down to say 10 to minus seven tor, the mean free path is gonna be half a kilometer, right? That's pretty amazing. Oh, and one more thing, those molecules are moving very fast. Um, as an example, at room temperature in high vacuum, an inert gas molecule is gonna be traveling at about half a kilometer per second. Now, there are different sets of units that we can select, uh, but for this webinar, I'm gonna describe pressure in terms of tor, pumping speed in liters per second. So the gas load Q, right, Q equals S times P is just tor liters per second. Uh, conceptually, we could convert to units of molecules per second to give you an idea of what's going on, but uh, tor liter per second is, uh, is a more convenient set of units to use. Now, a brief sidebar before we go any further, uh, you may have noticed that I used the term effective pumping speed. So it's not just the pump's pumping speed. What do we mean by this? Well, in almost all vacuum systems, there are going to be components between the pump and the chamber. And there may be some pathway, maybe a valve. Here's an example. Here's one of our vacuum furnaces. Uh, you can see the diffusion pump, right? It has the uh, big white cylinder with the cooling coils uh, shown there with the arrow in the lower left of the image. On top of that pump is a water cool baffle uh, to prevent backstreaming. We'll talk more about that later on. And then there's a large right angle gate valve. And then you see a cylindrical path leading into the chamber moving off to the right. The point is that each of these components has a property called conductance. Uh, that's gonna tell us about capacity to let gas move from one end to the other. And it turns out that you can add conductance in a vacuum system just like you would add capacitors in series. And that kind of makes sense, right? The more things you put in the path of the gas, the lower the overall conductance is going to be. And we use this conductance term because it allows us to get an idea of the effective pumping speed of our system. Conceptually, this equation tells us what's going on in our system. So you can have a high high-speed pump, but your conductance could be limiting your overall effective pumping speed. And just as a quick illustrative example, I, I have seen a pretty wacky system where the user had a turbo pump, four-inch conflat flange, but then they were neck down to a quarter-inch copper line connecting to their system. Now, that's kind of an extreme example of a conductance limitation, but I think you get the point here. All right, uh, let's move on. Now, turbo pumps and diffusion pumps often have a fairly broad region of pressure where the pumping speed, S, is constant. So if we assume that our conductance is constant, our pumping speed is constant, um, we can see here that reducing our pressure, P, is really going to be determined by our ability to reduce the total gas load, Q. All right? And before we can reduce our gas load, we need to understand the possible gas sources that we can identify. Uh, so we can identify what we're dealing with. Now, I personally have worked on a lot of different UHV systems, um, and it might be fun here to talk about why certain applications require low pressures. So let's talk about the de definition of a Langmuir. A Langmuir, which is named for Irving Langmuir, is the amount of gas exposure at a pressure of 10 to minus 6 torr for a period of one second. Let me say it again. The amount of gas exposure at 10 to minus 6 torr for one second. Conceptually, one Langmuir corresponds to the amount of gas dosage required to cover approximately one monolayer of a surface with gas. So roughly, uh, you have this rule of thumb that it takes about three seconds at 10 to minus 6 torr to cover a surface with one monolayer. Now, I'm not taking into account anything about molecule to surface sticking coefficients. The point here is that each order of magnitude reduction in pressure in terms of the time required to build up a monolayer of gas on a surface. All right, so we have our vacuum system and life is fine. We're gonna go through a little example here. And every day for the last several months or even years, 
uh, we know that we can reach a base pressure, let's say in the 10 to minus six tor. But then one day we notice that we can't even reach into the five range, which means we aren't even getting into the 10 to minus five tor readings. So let's assume for a moment that we've ruled out any issues with our pumps or gauges, something else is going on. One of the points I want to make here is that if you understand your system's base pressure and you understand its pump down behavior, then you're going to be in a much better position to detect an issue and begin to troubleshoot. Okay, what's going on with our system? It's time to look at the different sources of gas that could be going into our vacuum system. So as we talk about gas load in vacuum systems, I'm going to use this generic cylindrical chamber shown here. Uh, it has a door that swings open to the right. We can load up the chamber. We can close the door. We can pump it down. And the first source of gas that we're going to address are leaks. That seems pretty obvious, right? And there are really two kinds of leaks, and I'm going to address both real and virtual leaks. Real leaks are what most of us think of as a leak. Right? It's a pathway for molecules to travel from outside the chamber into the vacuum. And if you've never worked with high vacuum systems or been bitten by a real leak, you may be shocked to uh, learn the sort of things that can cause a leak. I have seen a single hair accidentally left across an O-ring create a leak path. Of course, not my hair, but it does bring up the requirement for cleanliness. It does not take much to cause a problem dirt, debris around vacuum systems are just opportunities for problems. Also, users can get nicks in Viton gaskets that are leak paths. So, as a good practice, you always want to inspect O-rings and gasket seals before you button up your system. You want to look for any uh, discontinuities in the uh, O-ring. You want to look for any, any sort of debris. Now, in metal sealed systems, tiny nicks in the knife edges on conflat flanges, of course, can be a, a leak path. So if you're bolting up a conflat flange, make sure you carefully inspect both the sealing faces as well as the copper gaskets. Uh, feed-throughs, uh, such as electrical feed-throughs or liquid feed-throughs, can also have issues um, at, at, uh, at the joints. Um, and a good rule of thumb is if you've recently installed a new component on a system that's maybe got a welded joint or something like that, you know, maybe the new thing that you've introduced is, is the problem, right? Maybe a leak has been introduced there. Bellows, uh, rotating seals, threaded joints, uh, if not properly uh, installed, um, all of these are areas to review when chasing down real leaks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are two kinds of leaks. Uh, we've discussed, we've touched on real leaks in which gas enters from the, in, enters the vacuum from the outside world in. Now we're going to discuss virtual leaks. A virtual leak occurs when you have a trapped volume of air inside the vacuum system. And the classic example of this is a blind tapped hole. So you see in the drawing that we have a screw that's going to be installed into the tapped hole. And now we have this trapped volume of gas that is slowly going to find its way into the vacuum chamber. This is known as a virtual leak. Oh, and every time the chamber is vented, the trapped volume can get reloaded. So tapped holes aren't the only examples of virtual leak. You can get virtual leaks from poorly welded materials that are installed in vacuum systems. I'll quickly mention that if you do need to attach something into a tapped hole in a vacuum system, then you may want to get a few uh, vented screws. And as you can see from this image, a vented screw allows the gas from the pocket to escape quickly into the chamber where it can be pumped away. And I want to thank UC Components uh, for the use of those images. All right, so let's take some time and pose a question. How do you know if you have a leak? Well, if you're lucky enough to have an RGA or a residual gas analyzer, life is a little easier because you can look for a large peak at mass 28, which may be nitrogen, as well as a peak at mass 32, indicating oxygen. If you have these peaks, then you're probably dealing with a leak. But many industrial systems out there don't have an RGA, right? Now, if you have a history of pump downs with your system, you can inspect the pump down curve. A normal curve is going to continue on down in pressure, while a leak is going to level off. On the flip side, you can look at what happens to your system when you valve off the main pump. 
the rate of rise in a system with a real leak will usually give a constant change of pressure over change in time. Also, the pressure will continue to rise until the system is all the way up to atmosphere. And I want to mention that our HVG 2020 series of vacuum gauges allow you to see both the pump down and vent cycle. So, and then you can also use our free data logging software through the digital port to collect pressure versus time data to help you understand uh, what's going on in your system. A couple of quick words about leak detection. Now, leak detection is a topic that deserves its own webinar. Uh, in fact, the American Vacuum Society uh, and other organizations teach entire courses on leak detection. But I will say a couple of things here. If you have a number of high vacuum systems, then you're probably going to want to invest in a good portable leak detector. Uh, when you're in a jam, they can bail you out. And I want to thank Agilent for the use of this figure. Um, they have a lot of experience when it comes to uh, leak detection. Now, if you're in the rough vacuum range, then you may be able to use the poor man's leak detector. That is, you can use the trick of spraying alcohol on a suspected leak and watch for any changes uh, on your rough vacuum gauge. Uh, sometimes you'll see the pressure initially drop as the leak is temporarily sealed off by hitting it with the alcohol, and then the pressure may spike back up. But if you're spraying it with alcohol and you see changes in your uh, rough vacuum gauge, um, you may be dealing with the leak. Okay, now let's assume uh, that we have a leak-free system, or at least mostly leak-free. Um, I have seen this one rule of thumb that leaks are sufficiently small if they contribute less than 10% of the total gas load. All right, so we're leak-free. The gas source that we're gonna have to battle next after the bulk gas has been removed is outgassing. And the biggest component of that outgassing is usually water vapor. Now, I've shown an area on our chamber on the left as the source of outgassing, but obviously in the case of water, it's everywhere, right? It coats everything, every time you vent, it's everywhere. And when we look at many pump down curves, the time to reach an acceptable pressure is limited by the desorption rate of the water off the walls of the chamber, off the material that's in the chamber and into the vacuum. Once the water molecules are out in the gas phase, they hopefully will find their way uh, to the pump. So what many folks do to reach UHV conditions, ultra high vacuum conditions, is they are going to bake out their system. Even uh, you can bake out uh, piping, that sort of thing, even if you don't need to reach UHV treatments. The, the point is, is that you want to get rid of the water vapor, get it out in the, in the gas phase, all right? So the chamber or piping can be wrapped up with heaters and then sometimes covered and then it's taken up to a high temperature, like say 200 degrees C. So you can see by this hand-drawn plot that during the bake, the pressure increases, but then once the system is brought back to room temperature, the pressure drops down. And you see that what we have done here is that we have shortened the time required to get to lower pressures. We bake systems here um, at Teledyne Hastings, uh, particularly in engineering. So if you look closely at the junction pointed out, with the arrow there between our six-way cross and a connecting gate valve off to the right, you can see that that six-way cross has seen many more bake out, uh, much more bake out action by the discoloration. And in preparing for this webinar, I came across a fun bake out statistic. Uh, these uh, images were taken from the uh, LIGO uh, website. Now the LIGO uh, gravitational wave detector has two interferometers and each of them has uh, each has two and a half mile long arms in the shape of an L. All right, you see one on the left, one in the middle. So you've got these two and a half mile long arms in the shape of an L. Now it took 40 days to pump that system down. The turbos removed the air and then the tubes, one of the tubes shown there on the right, the tubes were baked for 30 days at 150 to 170 degrees C. So real bake out going on there. Now, there are other sources of outgassing besides water. In some cases, a component or some material used on a component may be placed in a vacuum system that has an unacceptably high vapor pressure. All right, this is called vaporization. And examples would be certain plastics, uh, materials with paint, electronic components, uh, cadmium plating is known for high vapor pressure. Certain insulated wires could be a problem with respect to uh, outgassing. 
Uh, insulated wires can also be a source of virtual leaks. Uh, there are many fluxes that are used in soldering and brazing bolt-out gas. And in addition to the materials in the chamber, the chamber itself should be made of a suitable material, um, stainless steel, aluminum, that sort of thing, something with a low outgassing rate. Now, I have seen systems made up using PVC, right? And sometimes you'll see PVC used in, in four lines. Uh, but as you can imagine, due to vaporization, that's only going to take you uh, so far. Oh, and one last thing I want to mention about vaporization. I just saw Steve Hansen. He's the uh, contributing editor for Vacuum Technology and Coding Magazine. He just had a nice write-up on vapor pressure basics in the most recent issue of Vacuum Technology and Coding Magazine. So if you want to read uh, more about uh, vaporization, uh, check that out. Now, another source of gas that you may have to contend with is backstreaming. In backstreaming, pump fluid gas molecules can actually move back up through the pump and into the chamber. So often you will find cold traps and baffles on top of large diffusion pumps to help reduce backstreaming. So a quick recap here. We've run through leaks, real and virtual. We've talked about outgassing, uh, water desorption, vaporization, other materials, and we touched real quickly on backstreaming. Next, we're going to briefly describe diffusion. Now, uh, in the UHV world, and obviously this chamber, you know, with the door opening up to the right with an O-ring seal, probably not going to be an, a, a UHV system, but just for uh, illustration here. In the UHV world, where we've baked out, uh, we've got a mostly water-free system now. Uh, when we have a leak-free and we've baked out the system, the two gases that are going to be left usually are going to be hydrogen and CO, right? Those are going to be the dominant residual gases. And both hydrogen and CO diffuse out from the grain boundaries in the stainless steel. Now, hydrogen is a very small atom, right? Uh, and it can easily diffuse through most metal. When a hydrogen atom reaches the surface, it can combine with another hydrogen atom and it enters the gas phase as an H2 molecule. That's a little bit on diffusion. And lastly, uh, we're going to talk about permeation. Now, permeation is where gas molecules make it all the way through from outside the chamber into the vacuum. So it's kind of a three-step process, right? You, you start with the absorption of gas on the outside of the material. You've got the diffusion through the material, and then you have desorption or outgassing into the vacuum. Now, nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor, uh, they all travel, um, I should say water molecules, all travel as a molecule. But hydrogen actually moves through as an atom H. That is, we say it dissociates in the metal and then it recombines at the surface. Now, permeation rates in polymers, like such as this Viton O-ring, uh, can be very, very high. So, in many industrial vacuum systems with Viton O-ring seals and gaskets, permeation will probably become an issue, especially as you try to reach, you know, through the 10 of my 6 tor and into the 10 of my 7 range uh, and lower. Obviously, if you can reduce the number of these polymeric seals, then you can reduce the permeation gas load. Now, I know that was a fast tour, but you now have a, a more complete picture. Each of the gas sources that we touched on today, leaks, outgassing, permeation, backstreaming. And which one of these sources is limiting your system will often be a function of your application. The pressure requirements, say, for vacuum metallurgy are going to be very different than those required for AC refrigeration. And, of course, most particle accelerators require the very best conditions that can be generated. So think about what you need for your process, and then take a look at that basic equation that we introduced earlier. Remember, Q equals S times P. Can you deal with the gas sources that you have in your system? Or do you need to think about the materials and seals that may be causing a, an issue? Or do you need to go another step and look at the effect of pumping speed, including conductance limitations, or maybe even your um, pump selection? And before we leave, I want to mention a couple of places where you can get help. Uh, the American Vacuum Society at abs.org has books and monographs for members, and the uh, SVC, that is the Society of Vacuum Coders, has education guides. Now, there are a lot of books on vacuum technology out there, 
Um, I'm going to mention two real quickly. Uh, one I like is the Foundations of Vacuum Science, edited by James Lafferty. Uh, it's got a lot of the math behind the science, but don't let that scare you off. There's a lot of good information there. And Vacuum Heat Treatment by Daniel Herring has a, lots of practical vacuum technology material. And if you have any questions about vacuum gauging, mass flow meters, or mass flow controllers, we hope you will reach out to us at Teledyne Hastings. I want to thank you for listening to this webinar. Again, to learn more about our products, get other webinars, or watch product videos, please visit us at www.teledyne-hi.com. Have a great day.